Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to PayPal's fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to introduce your host for today's call, Ms. Gabrielle Rabinovich, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to PayPal Holdings Earnings Conference Call for the fourth quarter and full year 2019. Joining me today on the call are Dan Schulman, our President and CEO, and John Rainey, our Chief Financial Officer and EVP Global Customer Operations. We're providing a slide presentation to accompany our commentary. This conference call is also being webcast and both the presentation and call are available through the Investor Relations section of our website. We will discuss some non-GAAP measures in talking about our company's performance. You can find the reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures in the presentation accompanying this conference call. In addition, management will make forward-looking statements that are based on our current expectations, forecasts and assumptions, and involve risks and uncertainties. These statements include our guidance for the first quarter and full year 2020, our medium-term guidance, and the impact of our acquisitions. Our actual results may differ materially from these statements. You can find more information about risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could affect our results in our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly reports on Form 10-Q filed with the SEC and available on the Investor Relations section of our website. You should not rely on any forward-looking statements. All information in this presentation is as of today's date, January 29, 2020. We expressly disclaim any obligation to update the information. With that, let me turn the call over to Dan. Thank you, Gabrielle, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join us on today's call. I'm pleased to report that PayPal had a strong quarter, ending 2019 with record results across key customer and financial metrics. Over the past year, we meaningfully improved and expanded the PayPal platform. We strengthened our value proposition for consumers and merchants, expanded our international scope and scale, and announced transformative strategic acquisitions, investments, and commercial agreements. For the year, we delivered $17.8 billion in revenue, That's up 19% on an FX neutral basis adjusted for our receivable sale to synchronate. In the fourth quarter, we generated $4.96 billion of revenue, growing 18% on an FX neutral basis. Our strong revenue growth combined with discipline and expense management enabled a 28% year-over-year increase in our non-GAAP earnings per share to $3.10, excluding net unrealized gains on our strategic investments. We delivered $2.96 of non-GAAP EPS, up 25% on a year-over-year basis. On that same basis, in Q4, We delivered $0.84 of non-GAAP EPS, growing 28%. For 2019, our overall payment volume grew 25% on an FX neutral basis to $712 billion. Excluding eBay, TPV grew 29% on an FX neutral basis to $649 billion as we continue to grow market share. In Q4 alone, we processed just shy of $200 billion of TPV, a new record for us. We processed more than 12 billion transactions in the year, including nearly 3.5 billion transactions in Q4 alone eBay's TPV continues to decline, shrinking by 4% on an FX neutral basis. 
Consequently, we anticipate that eBay will be approximately 6% of our total TPV by mid-year. We added 9.3 million net new actives in the quarter, ending the year with 305 million active accounts on our platform, up 14% year over year, including 24 million merchants. In 2020, we expect to add approximately 35 million net new active accounts, inclusive of our acquisitions, and this does not include any one-time impact on NNAs associated with the acquisition of Honey. I'm pleased to report that engagement continues to consistently increase. For the first time this year, engagement grew by double digits increasing by 10% to 40.6 transactions per active account. Mobile transactions are a major driver of our growth, representing 44% of TPV. One-touch adoption is now at 199 million consumers and 14 million merchants. Venmo processed $29 billion in volume for the quarter, growing 56%. And for the year, volume increased to $102 billion. We ended the year with Venmo's customer base exceeding 52 million active accounts, driving its current revenue run rate of more than $450 million. Last quarter, we announced that Venmo had signed a deal with Synchrony to provide a Venmo credit card. I'm pleased to announce that Visa will be our exclusive network partner for this new product. We also recently announced our first ever Venmo rewards program with select merchants for Venmo debit card holders. These merchant-funded rewards are deposited directly into a customer's account so that they can be used in-app with merchants or transferred to a bank account or debit card, providing consumers with ease and choice. Last year, we saw brands like Netflix, Pepsi, and Chipotle use Venmo payouts to reward their customers and pay them via Venmo. We are excited to introduce new monetizable value-added services to our Venmo platform over the course of 2020. We continue to see strong demand for our payouts capabilities, enabled by our hyper-wallet acquisition. Digital payouts are attractive to multiple industries, including the insurance industry, where consumers are demanding faster payments. In the quarter, we began delivering claims payments on behalf of insurance providers like Chubb Insurance, Assurian, and Combined Insurance. In addition, United Airlines is now leveraging our platform to pay passengers all over the world for baggage claims. And Walmart is using our capabilities to pay merchants on its marketplace. I expect to see continued growth in our payouts products. Earlier this month, we closed the acquisition of Honey. The addition of Honey and its complementary capabilities to the PayPal network will significantly transform our relevance and drive engagement with our consumers and merchants at the earliest stages of their commerce journey. Our integration activities are off to a strong start. Our early joint marketing activities have already produced nearly 100,000 downloads of the Honey Browser extension. And on day one, our customers could use their PayPal credentials to log into Honey. I continue to be impressed by the caliber of the Honey team, and I couldn't be happier to welcome them to PayPal. We are deepening our relationships with financial institution partners around the world. We recently announced the ability for Citibank institutional clients to make payments directly into their customers' PayPal wallets. In December, we finalized the deal with FIS, 
which will enable us to scale our pay with rewards capabilities across thousands of financial institutions in the United States. And U.S. Bank is currently integrated functionality to support both account linking and pay with rewards capabilities. We continue to expand our platform capabilities around the world. We recently expanded our relationship with Uber and will be processing their payments in Europe, Brazil, India, and across the Middle East. In December, we also signed a commercial agreement with Mercado Libre that has the potential to drive a meaningful increase in our international scope and scale. As part of the agreement, PayPal will be made available as a payment option in the Mercado Pago online checkout for people in Brazil and Mexico, which opens the door for PayPal consumers to shop at hundreds of thousands of new merchants. PayPal will also be accepted in the Mercado Libre marketplace for cross-border purchases. In return, we will offer, offer Mercado Pago as a payment method at PayPal merchants around the world, allowing approximately 50 million Mercado Pago users in Brazil and Mexico to pay with their preferred digital wallet. And we will expand Zoom's presence by allowing Mercado Pago users to receive remittances directly into the Mercado Pago wallet. I'm pleased with our growing partnership and look forward to continued collaboration with Marcos and the Melli team. In addition to the continued international expansion of Zoom, in Q4, we launched the ability for Zoom customers to send money to recipients in the U.S. through strategic alliances with Walmart and Euronet. Customers in the U.S. can now use Zoom to quickly send money for cash pickup, typically within minutes, at nearly 5,000 locations across the country. This is a positive step in our mission to make the movement and management of money quick, easy, and affordable for everyone. In December, we closed our acquisition of GoPay, becoming the first foreign payment platform to be licensed to provide online payment services in China. This transaction has the potential to dramatically increase our total addressable market opportunity. Digital payments in China are expected to grow from $1.5 trillion to $3 trillion over the next four years, and the number of users is set to grow to well over $1 billion. Last week, we announced a wide-reaching partnership with Union Pay International. Union Pay International has issued over 130 million cards outside of mainland China, and is part of the China Union Pay Group, which has over 7.5 billion cards on their network. As part of the agreement, our mutual customers will be able to add Union Pay cards to their PayPal wallet in more than 30 countries, allowing Union Pay customers to seamlessly shop at PayPal's 24 million merchants globally. In addition, China Union Pay will enable Chinese merchants to accept PayPal in person where CUP cards are accepted. Our two companies will collaborate to accelerate both online and offline acceptance of PayPal for Chinese merchants. This is a landmark agreement and will have global impact for our joint customers. We look forward to partnering with other Chinese financial institutions and technology platforms to expand both cross-border and in-country digital payments. Our efforts to drive social impact and create value for all of our stakeholders continues to evolve and expand. This past year saw a record volume of funds raised by the PayPal community for charity. For the full year of 2019, the PayPal community donated more than $10 billion to charity, including over $1 billion in the month of December. On Giving Tuesday, 
we raised a record $106 million. The world's secular trend towards digital payments and commerce continues to rapidly grow. Our total adjustable market is significantly expanded with the acquisitions of Honey and GoPay and our commercial partnership with Mercado Libre. In 2020, our growth investments are focused on our recent acquisitions, growing our infrastructure in China and other international markets, Venmo monetization, and our in-store point-of-sale initiatives. Our ability to drive and benefit from these trends and initiatives is reflected in our strong results and our expectations for 2020. We are very excited about the year in front of us. Our brand reputation and trust are stronger than ever. We obviously need to execute, stay vigilant, and remain steadfast customer champions. But we have our sights set high, and we aim to aggressively expand our capabilities and geographic footprint. And I'm confident that our efforts will drive our market leadership and growth over the foreseeable future. And with that, I'll turn the call over to John. Thanks, Dan. I want to start off by thanking our customers, partners, and employees for helping us deliver an outstanding year. 2019 was another great year for PayPal, and I'm pleased with our team's accomplishments. The results we're reporting today demonstrate the consistent execution of our strategy to realize long-term, sustainable value creation. We're entering 2020 ready to build on our momentum, focused on our key initiatives, and excited about the year ahead. Now to our fourth quarter results. Revenue in the fourth quarter increased 17% on a spot basis and 18% on a currency neutral basis to $4.96 billion. The translation effects from the stronger dollar negatively impacted revenue by $35 million. This impact was more than offset by $58 million in hedge gains. Relative to the fourth quarter of 2018, U.S. revenue grew 19% and international revenue grew 17% on a currency neutral basis. Transaction revenue grew 18% and revenue from other value-added services grew 14%. Strength across core PayPal, Braintree, and Venmo all contributed to transaction revenue growth. Other value-added services revenue growth reflected solid performance of our credit business, offset by the lapping of interim servicing revenue from Synchrony. As a reminder, this headwind will continue through the second quarter of this year. In the fourth quarter, transaction take rate was 2.27%, and total take rate was 2.49%. Compared to Q4 2018, This was a decline of eight basis points and nine basis points, respectively, which is the lowest level of decline we've reported. Strong P2P growth continues to be the largest driver of the year-over-year decline for both transaction and total take rate. In addition, on a sequential basis, both transaction and total take rate improved. The diversification of our business and our pricing initiatives allowed us to deliver these results. Volume-based expenses increased 20% in the fourth quarter to $2.3 billion. Transaction expense was 96 basis points as a rate of TPV, consistent with the fourth quarter of 2018. Transaction loss was 15 basis points as a rate of TPV, an improvement of three basis points from Q4 2018. Continued improvements in our risk management capabilities contributed to the strong performance in our loss rate. Loan losses were four basis points as a rate of TPV, an increase of one basis point from Q4 last year. This increase primarily resulted from growth in both our merchant and international consumer loan portfolios. Transaction margin dollars grew 16% to $2.7 billion in the fourth quarter. Transaction margin as a rate was 53.8% a decline of approximately 90 basis points versus Q4-18. Non-transaction-related expenses 
grew 7% versus last year and increased only 13 cents for every incremental dollar of revenue. On a non-GAAP basis, operating income in the fourth quarter grew 28% to $1.2 billion. Our operating margin was 23.6%, expanding 204 basis points from last year as we delivered leverage across all of our non-transaction-related expenses. This represents our strongest performance ever, demonstrating our sustained ability to scale at a low incremental cost. Other income in the fourth quarter declined by $33 million relative to last year. Net interest expense resulting from our debt issuance in September, as well as lower net unrealized gains from our strategic investments contributed to this result. As we disclosed in our 8K issued on January 9th, in the fourth quarter, on a per share basis, net unrealized gains contributed two cents to EPS versus four cents last year. Starting in 2020, we're updating our non-GAAP methodology to exclude the impact of gains and losses on our strategic investments. We believe this presentation will provide a better understanding of our operating performance and a more meaningful comparison of our results between periods. With this change, we no longer will issue an 8K following quarter end, disclosing the effect of net unrealized gains and losses on our results. In the fourth quarter, our non-GAAP effective tax rate was 17.2% versus 17.7% last year. Non-GAAP EPS for the fourth quarter grew 24% to $0.86. Cents. Adjusting for net unrealized gains, non-GAAP EPS grew 28%. We ended the quarter with cash, cash equivalents, and investments of $13.6 billion. In addition, we generated more than $1 billion of free cash flow, or approximately $0.22 cents of free cash flow for every dollar of revenue. During the quarter, we returned $305 million in capital to shareholders through share repurchases. I'd now like to discuss our guidance for the full year and the first quarter. Relative to the preliminary outlook for 2020 that we provided in October, we are raising our revenue expectations. We are also raising our earnings outlook, excluding the dilutive effect of acquisitions announced in 2019. The guidance we're providing has been updated to reflect the impact from our recent acquisitions of Honey and GoPay, the adoption of CECL, the new accounting standard for recognizing credit losses, and our expectations for currency movements. For the full year, we expect TPV to grow in the mid-20s percentage range. We expect to generate revenue between $20.8 billion and $21 billion. This range represents currency neutral growth of 18 to 19 percent, an increase from our initial outlook of 17 percent. Our guidance includes about one and a half points of growth from the acquisition of Honey at the midpoint of the range. Consistent with our preliminary outlook, this revenue guidance includes an approximate one-point headwind to growth from the lapping of our acquisitions of iZettle and HyperWallet, as well as an approximate one-point headwind from eBay's managed payments transition. In 2019, revenue from eBay's marketplaces business declined 4% and represented 14% of our revenue, an approximate 300 basis point decline from 2018. Since the end of 2015, eBay's annual contribution to our revenue has consistently declined from 26% of our total to 14% today and has grown at a compound annual rate of 2%. Over the same period, the rate of growth for the rest of our business has been 22%, or 10 times eBay's growth rate. As a result, we remain confident in our ability to successfully navigate eBay's continued transition to its managed payments program. I'd now like to turn to our EPS guidance. On our third quarter call, we indicated that our preliminary outlook for EPS growth in 2020 was 17 to 18 percent. Since then, our expectations for core earnings growth have improved. Before incorporating the impact of the two acquisitions we recently closed, we now expect our EPS to grow between 18 and 20 percent. 
This growth rate of 18 to 20 percent incorporates a one-point headwind to earnings growth from Cecil while reflecting our underlying business strength. In addition, we expect 8 to 10 cents in dilution, or about a three-point headwind to earnings growth from our acquisitions of Honey and GoPay. As a result, we now expect non-GAAP earnings per share to grow 15 to 17 percent and be in the range of $3.39 to $3.46. While we expect the acquisition of Honey to be dilutive this year, we expect this transaction to be accretive to earnings of 2021. Honey is an exciting addition to our platform, and this year we will be accelerating investments to develop a truly integrated and differentiated wallet experience for our customers. We are also realizing dilution in 2020 from funding this acquisition with cash. In addition, in 2020, following our acquisition of GoPay, we're investing in our local Chinese infrastructure and capabilities and building upon our new partnership with China UnionPay to strengthen the foundation of our cross-border platform for small and medium-sized Chinese businesses and develop a cross-border shopping experience for Chinese consumers. We will also be investing to enable in-store shopping experiences for non-Chinese consumers visiting China. I'd also like to provide some context for our expectations related to our operating margin performance. In 2019, we expanded our operating margin by approximately 160 basis points, or nearly three times the average annual rate of expansion contemplated by our medium-term guidance. In 2020, we expect our operating margin to remain essentially flat as a result of absorbing acquisition-related dilution while continuing to invest in our other key strategic initiatives. This year, as Dan just discussed, in addition to prioritizing spending on our recent acquisitions, we're also investing in Venmo, our new partnerships, international expansion, and our in-store point-of-sale strategies. We expect to deliver operating margin performance consistent with the highest in our history while investing in these significant growth opportunities. We anticipate our non-GAAP effective tax rate will be between 16 and 18 percent. For 2020, we expect free cash flow to exceed $4 billion as we continue to generate approximately 20 cents of free cash flow for every dollar of revenue. In 2019, we returned more than $1.4 billion in cash to shareholders through stock repurchases and announced approximately $4.1 billion of acquisitions. In 2020, we will continue to balance return of capital with growth investments while maintaining an efficient capital structure. Our acquisition pipeline is healthy, and our balance sheet gives us the flexibility to be opportunistic. At the same time, we plan to continue to return cash to shareholders, consistent with our stated commitment for long-term capital return. For the first quarter, we expect revenue in the range of $4.78 billion to $4.84 billion, or 17 to 18% growth on a currency neutral basis. We expect non-GAAP earnings per share to be in the range of $0.76 cents to $0.78, cents, representing growth of 15 to 18%. Excluding the impact of acquisitions, our earnings guidance represents 19 to 22% growth. We expect our acquisitions announced in 2019 to have a more dilutive impact on earnings in the first half of 2020 than in the back half of the year. As a result, the 8 to 10 cents per share of expected non-GAAP earnings dilution is more heavily weighted to the first and second quarters of 2020. In summary, we're pleased with our performance in 2019. We delivered strong revenue growth, our highest operating margin, and record operating margin expansion and free cash flow generation. At the same time, we advanced our strategic priorities in our core and developing markets, strengthened our consumer and merchant value propositions, and launched new partnerships that are expanding our total addressable market. We're committed to our medium-term financial targets and are confident that the strength of our diversified platform, flexibility of our balance sheet, and execution capabilities will allow us to continue delivering value to our stakeholders. 
with that, I'll hand it back over to the operator for questions. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question and return to the queue for any follow-ups. Our first question comes from the line of Tin Sing Huang with J.P. Morgan. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. A lot, of, a lot of good information here. So uh, I'll ask on the outlook, if you don't mind, just your guidance this year versus last year. Aside from honey, how would you how would you characterize overall visibility this year versus this time a year ago? It seems like you have more in your control, but still lots of moving pieces. So love your thoughts on visibility. Yeah. Thanks, Anson. Um, it's Dan. I'll start on that, and then maybe John will uh, fill in on it. First of all, we had a strong Q4, um, and actually a uh, even stronger back half of Q4. The holiday season was strong for us. December was strong, and frankly, we're seeing a strong January uh, as well. Um, and that comes from a couple of things that we actually really didn't have uh, the year before. First of all, I think we're executing a lot better um, than we have for quite some time. Uh, second, and really important, uh, because we have the visibility in this, you know, we've seen the pricing uh, that we talked about start to get implemented. It's implemented in uh, a number of countries. We still have more countries to even roll that out into. Uh, but that's going exactly according to plan. We signed a number of very large deals uh, at the end uh, of the year. We implemented many of those in December, and we are seeing that those growth rates uh, begin to kick in. Those are uh, deals like Paymentis that we've talked about, but other very large multi-billion dollar deals um, as well. And so... Um, we're entering this year in really a fundamentally different place than we, uh, than we entered the uh, year before. A lot of momentum. For instance, we feel very comfortable uh, with our um, uh, forecasts around TPV. We were talking about TPV being in the mid-20s. You know, that was 22% in Q4, but of that uh, 22%, two, actually, uh, 200 basis points, I guess, was because of the lapping of IZETL. So you, uh, normalize for that, you're at 24, uh, little weakness in eBay, and then we've got these big, uh, deals that are already implemented, accelerating others like Uber, uh, to come, and we feel very comfortable. Uh, with our TPV accelerating into the uh, uh, mid-20s. So I'd say overall, we're pretty excited about where we're starting off the year, things that we already have in place, and we have a, a ton of initiatives that we're uh, excited about as well. So um, I don't know, John, would you add? To yeah, I, I'd maybe underscore a couple points that Dan mentioned. Um, I think what's notable, Tenjin, about this year versus last year is, in particular, how we're starting off the year. Um, you know, I, I, there's always a certain amount of trepidation that exists about the macro economy, but, um, you know, I think the macro economy was maybe a little wobblier last year, and, uh, and and we certainly enjoyed, I think, a better holiday season this period as we looked at the month of December, even going into January. And so we're we're starting off on, on the right start. But uh, but also I'd, I'd underscore the point he mentioned around execution. You know, we we recognize that we have a pretty precious opportunity here at PayPal when you combine the secular tailwinds of our business with the the incredible assets that we have when you look at our portfolio of products. Um, and it's it's uh, incumbent upon us to execute, and I think the team is executing as well now as they ever have. So uh, I get I think that gives us uh, more confidence than. Uh, uh, on a relative basis versus last year. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of James Saucet with Morgan Stanley. Great. Thank you very much. I wanted to touch on touch on a lot of different incremental market opportunities, but I want to 
touch on um, Venmo and, and the efforts to continue to develop that as a as a separate brand. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what the objectives are for growing Venmo monetization during 2020 uh, and and beyond, and how we should be measuring those? And, and I guess kind of dovetailed with that. Now that Visa owns Plaid, um, it, it seems like I just wonder how that may impact the ability to grow Venmo and, and some of these other ancillary services, whether it be internationally, et cetera. Thanks a lot. Yeah. James, um, thanks for the question. And we were continued to be pleased every quarter uh, with uh, the performance of uh, Venmo. Um, even as it's gotten larger, We've seen strong net new actives. You know, we've got 52 million uh, now uh, at year end. We'd always said we thought Venmo would wind up with over 100 billion of TPV, and it wound up at 102 billion. It's up about 60 percent uh, for the year. You know, exited I think at about a 56 percent uh, growth rate. You know, its revenue run rate right now is over 450 million. Uh, dollars um, and as we're getting that scale on the revenue side, you know we're beginning to see uh, losses reduce um, as well each year. So we kind of have a line of sight to when break even is and, and when this starts to actually turn profitable um, as well. We don't want to slow down its growth at all. We want to keep uh, enabling Venmo to grow as rapidly as possible. But we're really pleased with its trajectory, and I uh, expect to see good revenue growth, uh, continued uh, strong, strong revenue growth on the Venmo side. We're adding new capabilities uh, all the time. Uh, Debit is continuing to expand. Uh, We're going to put a big emphasis on pay with Venmo. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of work going on uh, around that right now because we think that's a very big opportunity that we did not take uh, as much advantage of uh, last year as we probably could have. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, we are going to be developing a credit card that was a very competitive process with a number of issuers. Uh, looking to work with us on that. Uh, it's very competitive on the network side, too. Uh, so we're really pleased with the economics around that. You'll see us add things like just like goods and services. Goods and services is one of the biggest money makers on the PayPal P2P side. We're going to add that into uh, uh, the Venmo side, and there are a number of other uh, monetizable services uh, that you'll see come out that uh, will reveal uh, – uh, in uh, in good time as as they're introduced. Uh, in terms of um, Plaid, you know we've worked uh, quite closely with Plaid uh, in terms of using Plaid to uh, integrate uh, into um, bank accounts of different banks. We are working uh, sometimes with some of the larger banks to uh, integrate directly and and um, with Plaid really for quite a number of the banks and uh, and really for that long tail. We were really happy uh, with the acquisition of Plaid by Visa. Um, we've uh, worked, obviously, very, very closely with Visa um, and MasterCard and the other networks, but very closely with Visa. Uh, we're an investor, or we're an investor uh, in Plaid, so we know them quite well. And I think the security enhancements um, that Visa will do on top of the Plaid network will have the banks are more comfortable in utilizing uh, Plaid. Visa obviously has a tremendous global scale. Uh, and as you saw in the Plaid announcement uh, from Visa, I was one of the folks quoted on that because we really look forward to working with Visa to see how we can take advantage of this uh, uh, joint platform now that they own uh, Plaid. And there could be a lot of uh, different opportunities as a result of that. So I hope that answers anything else, John? Nope. nope. No. Thanks for the Thank question, Jane. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Brian Keene with Deutsche Bank. Hi, guys. Good afternoon. Um, John, I was just hoping to get clarification on the TPV 
The FX neutral growth dropped from 27% in 3Q to 22% in 4Q. Um, so just want to understand that delta. But probably even more importantly is the, the walk or reacceleration to the mid-20% going into uh, this year. So I know I'm not sure how much honey is a factor there or the Uber, Union Pay, Melly deals. Maybe you could give us a walk on how to get back to that mid-20s TPB. Thanks. Sure, Brian. So it's good to speak with you. So if you look at our TPV, um, whether you look at overall or international, the biggest single driver of the decline is related to the lapping of the IZL acquisition. In fact, if you just looked at international TPV, the entirety of that four-point decline is attributable to, to IZL. But looking at um, – TPD in total, there are some other factors, but, you know, one is obviously eBay. Um, we saw about a point decline uh, related to eBay, and, and if you sort of decompose that a little bit, even look at our transactions, and you look at the various parts of our business, the, the transactions to, related to eBay declined 6% for us in the quarter. Um, and so this has been, you know, something that we've talked about. The, the next year will begin that uh, period where, we're, where we will transition away from that, uh, but we're still seeing the rest of our business grow quite well. And so as we look into 2020, there are a number of things that will um, bridge that uh, back to the mid-20s. Part of it is just the acceleration we're seeing in the business right now, as Dan alluded to, in the December-January time frame. But uh, we've got international expansion going on next year. We've got some work being done with large merchants. You know that we're uh, ramping up with Paymentus and then other other parts of our business that um, we're emphasizing more like uh, um, recurring payments, subscriptions, bill pay that uh, give us confidence that we'll be able to achieve that, that mid-20s TPV number, even in a period where we are transitioning away from the eBay, and, and I think it's worth mentioning, and doing it while expanding operating margins in 2019 and, and, and giving us the latitude to make the investments that we need in 2020 to continue this trend of mid-20s TPV growth into the future. Yeah. I just add a, a little bit on to uh, what John uh, said. Um, you know, what probably pleased me the most about Q4 is to see um, coming out of it uh, the reacceleration of a lot of our core trends. Our core business started to accelerate. Braintree, even though it's gotten larger and larger, um, I'll bet its uh, growth rate will be uh, larger than it was uh, this year going forward. We know what deals we have in place. Uh, and we know we've got, uh, um, I would say, quite good visibility uh, into um, uh, what our TPV looks like. So we're very comfortable with that um, uh, projection on that, and we're seeing it in our trend lines. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Lisa Ellis with Moffitt Nathanson. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Um, Question on China. Now that you've successfully acquired the majority stake of GoPay and then signed the uh, more recent expanded agreement with CUP, could you just provide a bit of color on your overall market entry strategy to the domestic market there? Meaning, are you more focused on, say, building out the presence of the PayPal wallet as a competitor to some of the local digital wallets, or are you more focused on Braintree and building out broader payment processing? Um, could you give us a little bit of, of color there? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll take that, and then um, John can do that. Um, I said, Lisa, the um, first idea uh, that we had uh, working with uh, the PBOC is, you know, people now need to have a legal basis um, to have a payments license inside China to provide both cross-border uh, and domestic payments capability. Uh, we worked over the last several years uh, closely with the PBOC, and we invested um, a lot of dollars and uh, resources into our compliance and risk management efforts across the business. So not only do we have a close relationship with the PBOC, but 
now with regulators around the world. Um, that uh, legal basis um, allows us to look at cross-border and work very closely with multinational that uh, have established shop uh, in China, one of the few now platforms where that uh, international uh, payments traffic can go over. We also now have the ability to work inside of China uh, with either uh, folks like CUP, other tech platforms, uh, financial institutions inside China to link uh, their cards into our wallet so Chinese consumers uh, can use uh, our platform to do uh, purchases at our 24 million merchants outside of China. One of the most exciting things that we have, though, going on, because, you know, the um, agreement that we have with Union Pay International and China Union Pay is really, you know, a landmark arrangement. I mean, inside China, China Union Pay is the network. It's the equivalent of deals that we might have struck with Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and Amex all in one. Um, it's that significant in terms of a player. They obviously have very close relationships uh, with the uh, banks, um, and we believe that we can start linking um, their payment instruments into our wallet, and China Union Pay uh, and PayPal will be looking to expand acceptance of the um, PayPal wallet uh, with Chinese merchants. And um, that will enable also travelers coming into China uh, to be able to use the PayPal wallet to purchase. And as you know, Lisa, probably better than anybody on this call, you know, um, if you're going to be buying things inside China, it is with your mobile phone, it is with QR codes. And if you're a visitor coming in, it's difficult to start to, uh, to do those purchases. And you'll now be able to use your uh, PayPal account uh, to go and do that. Again, this will take some time uh, to develop uh, and, uh, and to implement, um, but that is our vision. Um, and um, I would also say in our conversations um, with some of the key players uh, inside of China, um, other capabilities on our platform, like full stack processing, um, they are interested in utilizing those capabilities and working with uh, merchants as well. So it's a relatively comprehensive set of opportunities we have. I know some folks believe, you know, because obviously the strong positions that Ali and WeChat have uh, inside uh, the company, uh, wondering how much opportunity. This is an explosive market. We are going to be working hand in hand. Uh, with key uh, Chinese players inside the market. We have strength in cross-border, and we think the combination of that offers a significant opportunity for us. Again, this will play out over time, but I have to say we're pretty uh, excited and uh, uh, and investing uh, against this opportunity. So, Lisa, Lisa, I'd add that I, th I think a couple points. It is a significant investment. Um, that, uh, you know, we are managing in 2020 and it will carry into 2021. But it's also a significant opportunity. Uh, just uh, yeah, the estimates that I see is by next year, China will be 40% of worldwide cross-border TPV. And this is a market where we have roughly 1% penetration into their half a billion digital users. Uh, and you compare that to our core markets where we're significantly penetrated. Um, if we can turn that 1% into 2, 3, 4, 5%, that's a big opportunity for us. But, but I think one thing I want to emphasize around this investment is the things that we're doing in China and the way that we're investing there, it's a scalable solution for other markets. Uh, so we're approaching this as if there will be other opportunities where we can have a much more prominent presence in those markets versus kind of dabbling in some of these markets like we do today without our full product. 
And so we're taking a very long-term perspective and investing, investing appropriately given the significance of the opportunity. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Darren Peller with Wolf Research. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, look, it's good to see your confidence in TPV growth being mid-20s again for the year. I assume a part of that is engagement. Engagement obviously did well this quarter. It was up 10% and it accelerated. It just, I'd love to hear more about the drivers of that, you know, how sustainable that is. Do you expect uh, that 10% growth rate to either stay the same or get better? Um, and then when we think about honey, a big part of our thesis on honey is that the flywheel effect could help that even more. Uh, can you just touch on the opportunity there as well? Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, Darren, it's Dan. Uh, thanks for that question. I think you uh, know from uh, talking to us that uh, uh, engagement is one of the most important drivers for us, and we are very focused on it. You know, when I started, you know, some almost six years ago now, you know, we were at 17 times a year. Uh, you know, we're at 41 right now. But, look, our our goal, uh, and we realize that this is um, aspirational, you know, is for somebody to uh, use PayPal uh, or Venmo every single day. That is our goal, is to have daily engagement with that. We have a long ways to go uh, before we get there. Honey, we think, significantly uh, increases our engagement uh, with consumers. Um, it um, allows us to be more towards the beginning of the uh, shopping journey, more towards the intent piece of this. The great thing is that one-third of all commerce transactions start with some sort of trigger-based event, um, whether that be a promotion uh, or some kind of deal. And Honey uh, enables um, us to uh, take um, uh, full advantage of those trigger-based type of capabilities. And, you know, Honey is not just you know, coupons, it's far from it. It's a mobile shopping assistant. It's an offers platform. It provides rewards. It does price tracking tools and alerts. There are drop lists and wish lists, that kind of thing. And so we think, and by the way, the Honey team had already saved last year alone its customers a um, billion dollars of opportunity on products and services. And so we think there's a lot of opportunity for engagement and scaling of that Honey app as we integrate it uh, into the PayPal and, uh, and Venmo uh, apps. But that's only one part of what we're thinking about in terms of engagement. We talked about Paymentus and a lot of what we people think about Paymentus is, you know, the full stack integration that we're doing with them. And, uh, but we're also going to be uh, implementing bill pay capabilities into our consumer apps. Bill pay is obviously another form uh, of engagement. John mentioned recurring payments, um, whether it be uh, your Spotify, Hulu, Disney, any of a number of um, recurring payment streams where we can make it simple and easy for you to pay that. If your credit card expires, we'll automatically update it. You don't have to keep throwing that out. And so we're going to do a ton around that and one of the big areas of opportunity for us is starting to move into the offline space. 10%, 12% of commerce is done online mobile. That's obviously growing rapidly. But, you know, you, you look at the tremendous opportunity around the world and even here in the United States beginning to move into um, offline through things like whether it be IZETL capabilities on the merchant side, whether it be through all the cards, and we're a major issuer of cards right now tied into uh, your PayPal account, or through QR codes, which we are already experimenting with. And if you look inside your PayPal app or your Venmo app, you'll see prominently uh, displayed a, a scan capability or the ability to show uh, your own QR code to be scanned uh, by a merchant. And we have 
the wherewithal on all Android phones, but not Apple phones yet, to be able to use the NFC chip to be able to do tap to pay, uh, tap to pay capabilities. And so that will be another big thing that we'll be investing in this year, all around driving uh, uh, engagement. And the big thing about engagement, if you think about net new actives, You know, when you get to be the scale that we are now with 305 million people on our platform, every time you start to improve that engagement, churn comes down as well. And lifetime value starts to go up. And so this can be a real flywheel for us, and we are um, investing um, heavily in, um, in our engagement activities and you know, I would expect to see good engagement growth. Thank you. And we have time for one last question from David Togut with Evercore. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Bridging to Darren's question, um, if you could perhaps expand upon integration plans and priorities uh, for Honey Science and then Just as a quick follow-up, now that you own Honey for a few weeks, any updated thoughts on uh, capital allocation priorities between share repurchase and uh, further acquisitions? Uh, David, I'll I'll start with the last part of your question and let Dan talk a little bit about some of the integration plans. Um, We don't don't, uh, anticipate changing our capital allocation priorities uh, going forward. And as a reminder, that's spending about 40 to 50 percent of our free cash flow uh, towards returning uh, buying back stock, returning cash to shareholders, and then uh, one to three billion dollars per year in, in acquisitions. Uh, again, I, I point to the, the cash generation of our business, and I, I think that gives us, uh, in some ways, a competitive advantage versus the other players in the landscape uh, that uh, we compete with, because. Uh, You know, we have the opportunity to go out and acquire companies and acquire capabilities as well as invest internally, as well as return cash to shareholders. And uh, and many times things uh, that we want to go after inorganically um, allow us to be faster to market or to provide capabilities that we maybe think um, are better than others. And so we'll continue to be acquisitive. Uh, We'll continue to return cash to shareholders, and we'll continue to invest in ourselves. Uh, And David, let me uh, go and. But before I answer that, Operator, I think we have time for one more question uh, after this. So maybe we'll just keep the line open for uh, one more additional question. Um, so a uh, quick update on, on Honey. Um, first of all, I said this in, uh, in my opening remarks. Um, I want to emphasize that the caliber of that Honey team is extraordinary. Uh, they are great product and engineers. Uh, they react extraordinarily quickly. You know, when we acquired Zoom, admittedly, that was a number of years ago, and our tech stack uh, did not have all of the service-oriented architecture that we have today. But we were able, uh, with Zoom, it took us something like six to nine months to integrate login with PayPal onto the Zoom uh, app. With Honey, day number one, PayPal customers could log in with their credentials right onto the Honey app. Day number one, we were doing cross-marketing together. We have a full plan over the course of the year by quarter on exactly functionality um, that we um, are integrating together. The big thing uh, for us is to integrate uh, Honey into our uh, mobile apps. We have significant scale uh, on those mobile apps. That is uh, a relatively heavy engineering lift, uh, but we are looking at uh, that in the back half uh, of this year. But there are a host of payment capabilities uh, that we will integrate into the Honey app uh, going forward that are our payment capabilities, credit type of capabilities. And so we've got a full integration plan in place. I'm pretty pleased um, with uh, the execution against that. As John mentioned, our execution capabilities are are humming along uh, pretty well right now. Um, and um, I do think the combination 
of uh, Honey and PayPal is a very, very strong one. I think we can enhance the ways we serve both consumers and merchants. Look, merchants who are looking to us for full solutions right now are looking to our products to basically increase their sales in a world of digital commerce, and Honey is a big tool set for that. Uh, and we are, you know, excited about working with not just the 30,000 merchants they have today, but uh, pretty uh, dramatically uh, accelerating that. And obviously, it drives engagement and savings for uh, consumers. It enables us to move beyond checkout. Uh, it, we can enable personalized, timely, relevant offers for, con uh, for consumers and become a highly value-added partner. Uh, to uh, to our merchants. So we're um, quite excited about it, pleased with the integration so far. A lot to do, but we're very focused on it. One more Thank question, you. operator. Thank you. And our last question comes from the line of Heath Terry with Goldman Sachs. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I know you've talked a lot about China and, and some of the other bigger initiatives in, in 2020 already, but it, can we step back and just and just talk about and, and maybe even prioritize sort of where those investment priorities in 2020 fall and the incremental costs that you see associated with them, where, where those fall in the, the, the guidance, um, and then as we look out over time, sort of the ability that you see to, to sustain operating margin expansion over time as you take on um, those those incremental costs. Sure, Heath. This is John. I'll I'll tackle that. Um, Thanks, John. You know, well, it's not a comprehensive list. I would say a couple things that stand out in terms of our investment priorities for 2020. One would be the consumer value proposition, and. Uh, a sub-bullet or sub-bullets underneath that are honey, as well as what we're doing with expanding our offline uh, point-of-sale offerings. So that's a big investment priority. Uh, also, Venmo is a big investment priority, and I'd, I'd also throw in there international expansion. All of those, and international expansion includes China. So all of those things are, are significant costs and really um, uh, are of a significant magnitude that absent that, we'd be expanding operating margins again next year. But I'll point you to a number that I think maybe can help direct you to how to think about our long-term capability to expand operating margin. So in the quarter, if you looked at our incremental operating margin, so the, the incremental growth in operating income divided by the incremental revenue, it was roughly 35%. And, and I think that's a, that's a fantastic number and one that's, that has really been pretty consistent throughout the year, but at a much higher level than what it's been in previous years. And this is the point that I continue to go back to about our ability to grow our platform at a low incremental cost. And if we can continue to generate the type of revenue growth that we have and do it at a low marginal cost that results in you know, incremental operating margins north of 30%, then I, I'm confident we're going to create a lot of shareholder value here. And I think that's a good way to think about our business long term. Yeah. And I just add to that. I mean, I think about, you know, our guidance uh, for 2020. This is, you know, the beginning of the eBay transition. We're ending the year closing in on $18 billion. Uh, and we are talking about uh, FX neutral revenue growth of uh, 18 to 19 uh, percent. Um, we're looking at, you know, excluding, um, you know, acquisitions, like something like 19 to 21 uh, percent uh, EPS growth, especially absorbing the CECL impact uh, on that. If you look over the last three years, our EPS, CAGR, has grown at 27 percent. And so we have really strong conviction uh, in our ability to execute uh, against our medium-term guidance. And I think John's right. We want to invest. We want to seize the growth opportunities that are ahead of us uh, and do that in a way that's consistent uh, with the uh, medium-term guidance that we put out as well as um, uh, execute uh, year over year. So um, 
I think we're, we're feeling like we're entering into 2020 in a strong position, uh, and it gives us more confidence uh, than we had when we entered into, uh, into last year, uh, and a lot of conviction around our medium-term guidance. Thanks, so, Dan. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. So I want to um, thank you, Heath, for that that question, and thank all of you uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time, and we look forward to speaking with all of you soon. Thanks a lot. This concludes today's Q and A session, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for participating in today's conference call. This concludes the program, and you may now disconnect. Everyone, have a great afternoon.